Thus far have we followed Kaiser's actions before the wars of Gaul. After this, he seems to begin his course afresh, and to enter upon a new life and scene of action. And the period of those wars which he now fought, and those many expeditions in which he subdued Gaul, showed him to be a soldier and general not in the least inferior to any of the greatest and most admired commanders who had ever appeared at the head of armies. For if we compare him with the Fabii, the Metelli, the Scipios, and of those who were his contemporaries, or not long before him, Scylla, Marius, the Luculli, or even Pompey himself, whose glory, it may be said, went up at that time to heaven for excellence in every war. We shall find Kaiser's actions to have surpassed them all. One he may be held to have have done in consideration of the difficulty of the country in which he fought, another in the extent of territory which he conquered, some in the number and strength of the enemy whom he defeated, one man, because of the wildness and perfidiousness of the tribes whose good will he conciliated, another in his humanity and clemency to those he overpowered, others, again, in his gifts and kindnesses to his soldiers, all alike in the number of the battles which he fought and the enemies whom he killed. For he had not pursued the wars in Gaul full ten years when he had taken by storm above eight hundred towns, subdued three hundred states, and of the three millions of men, who made up the gross sum of those who, at several times he engaged, he had killed one million, and taken a captive a second. He was so much master of the goodwill and hearty service of his soldiers, that those who in other expeditions were but ordinary men displayed a courage past defeating, or withstanding when they went upon any danger where Kaiser's glory was concerned. Such a one was Achilles, who, in the sea fight before Marseille, had his right hand struck off with a sword, yet did not quit his buckler out of his left, but struck the enemies in the face with it, till he drove them off and made himself master of the vessel. Such another was Cassius Sciva, who, in a battle near Dyrrachium, had one of his eyes shot out with an arrow, his shoulder pierced with one javelin, and his thigh with another, and having received one hundred and thirty darts upon his target, called to the enemy, as though he would surrender himself. But when two of them came up to him, he cut off the shoulder of one with a sword, and by a blow over the face forced the other to retire. And so with the assistance of his friends, who now came up, made his escape. Again in Britain, with some of the foremost officers had accidentally got into a morass full of water, and there were assaulted by the enemy. A common soldier, Wills Kaiser stood and looked on, threw himself in the midst of them, and after many signal demonstrations of his valor, rescued the officer, and beat off the barbarians. He himself, in the end, took to the water, and with much difficulty, partly by swimming, partly by wading, passed it, but in the passage he lost his shield. Kaiser and his officers sought and admired, and went to meet him with joy and acclamation. But the soldier, much dejected and in tears, threw himself down at Kaiser's feet, and begged his pardon for having let go his buckler. Another time in Africa, Scipio having taken a ship of Kaiser's in which Granius Petro, lately appointed quaestor, was sailing, gave the other passengers as free prize to his soldiers, but thought fit to offer the quaestor his life but he said it was not usual for Kaiser's soldiers to take but give mercy, and, having said so, fell upon his sword and killed himself. This love of honor and passion for distinction were inspired into them, and cherished in them by Kaiser himself, who, by his unsparing distribution of money and honors, showed them that he did not heap up wealth from the wars for his own luxury, or the gratifying his private pleasures, 
but that all he received was but a public fund laid by the reward and encouragement of valor, and that he looked upon all he gave to the serving soldiers as so much increase to his own riches. Added to this also, there was no danger to which he did not willingly expose himself, no labor from which he pleaded an exemption. His contempt of danger was not so much wondered at by his soldiers because they knew how much he coveted honor, but his enduring so much hardship, which he did to all appearance beyond his natural strength, very much astonished them. For he was a spare man, had a soft and white skin, was distempered in the head and subject to an epilepsy, which, it is said, first seized him at Cordoba. But he did not make the weakness of his constitution a pretext for his ease, but rather used war as the best physic against his indispositions. Whilst, by individual journeys, coarse diet, frequent lodging in the field, and continual laborious exercise, he struggled with his diseases and fortified his body against all attacks. He slept generally in his chariots or litters, employing even his rest in pursuit of action. In the day he was thus carried to the forts, garrisons, and camps, one servant sitting with him, who used to write down what he dictated as he went, and a soldier attending behind him with his sword drawn. He drove so rapidly that when he first left Rome he arrived at the river Rhone within eight days. He had been an expert rider from his childhood, for it was usual with him to sit with his hands joined together behind his back, and so to put his horse to its full speed. And in this war he disciplined himself so far as to be able to dictate letters from on horseback, and to give directions to two who took notes at the same time, or, as Opius says, to more. And it is thought that he was the first who contrived means for communicating with friends by cipher, when either press of business or the large extent of the city left him no time for a personal conference about matters that required dispatch. How little nice he was in his diet may be seen in the following instance. One at the table of Valerius Leo, who entertained him at supper at Milan, a dish of asparagus was put before him at which his host, instead of oil, had poured sweet ointment. Kaiser partook of it without any disgust, and reprimanded his friends for finding fault with it. For it was enough, he said, not to eat what you did not like. But he who reflects on another man's want of breeding shows he wants it as much himself. Another time upon the road he was driven by a storm into a poor man's cottage, where he found but one room, and that as such as would afford but a mean reception to a single person, and therefore told his companions places of honor should be given up to the greater men, and necessary accommodations to the weaker, and accordingly ordered that Opius, who was in bad health, should lodge within, whilst he and the rest slept under a shed at the door. His first war in Gaul was against the Helvetians and Tigurini, who, having burnt their own towns, twelve in number, and four hundred villages, would have marched forward through the part of Gaul which was included in the Roman province, as the Cimbrians and Teutons formerly had done. Nor were they inferior to these in courage, and in numbers they were equal, being in all three hundred thousand, of which one hundred and ninety thousand were fighting men. Kaiser did not engage the Tigurini in person, but Labienus, under his directions, routed them near the river Arar. The Helvetians surprised Kaiser, and unexpectedly set upon him as he was conducting his army to a confederate town. He succeeded, however, in making his retreat into a strong position where, when he had mustered and marshaled his men, his horse was brought to him, upon which he said, when I have won the battle, I will use my horse for the chase, but at present let us go against the enemy. 
and accordingly charged them on foot. After a long and severe combat, he drove the main army out of the field, but found the hardest work at their carriages and ramparts, where not only the men stood and fought, but the women also and children defended themselves till they were cut to pieces, insomuch that the fight was scarcely ended till midnight. This action, glorious in itself, Kaiser crowned with another yet more noble. By gathering in a body all the barbarians that had escaped out of the battle, above one hundred thousand in number, and obliging them to reoccupy the country which they had deserted, and the cities which they had burnt. This he did for the fear the Germans would pass and possess themselves of the land whilst it lay uninhabited. His second war was in defense of the Gauls against the Germans, though some time before he had made Ariovistus their king, recognized as Rome and as an ally. But they were very insufferable neighbors to those under his government, and it was probable, when occasion offered, they would renounce the present arrangements and march on to occupy Gaul. But finding his officers timorous, and especially those of the young nobility who came along with him in hopes of turning their campaigns with him into a means for their own pleasure or profit, he called them together and advised them to march off and not run the hazard of a battle against their inclinations, since they had such weak, unmanly feelings, telling them that he would take only the tenth legion and march against the barbarians, whom he did not expect to find an enemy more formidable than the Cimbri, nor, he added, should they find him a general inferior to Marius. Upon this, the Tenth Legion deputed some of their body to pay him their acknowledgments and thanks, and the other legions blamed their officers, and all, with great vigor and zeal, followed him many days' journey, till they encamped within two hundred furlongs of the enemy. Ariovistus's courage to some extent was cooled upon their very approach, for never expecting the Romans would attack the Germans, whom he had thought it more likely they would not venture to withstand even in defense of their own subjects, he was the more surprised at conduct, and saw his army to be in consternation. They were still more discouraged by the prophecies of their holy women, who foretell the future by observing the eddies of rivers, and taking signs from the windings and noise of streams and who now warned them not to engage before the next new moon appeared. Kaiser, having had intimation of this, and seeing the Germans lie still, thought it expedient to attack them whilst they were under these apprehensions, rather than sit still and wait their time. Accordingly, he made his approaches to the strongholds and hills on which they lay encamped, and so galled and fretted them that at last they came down with great fury to engage but he gained a signal victory, and pursued them for four hundred furlongs, as far as the Rhine. All which space was covered with spoils and bodies of the slain. Ariovistus made shift to pass the Rhine with the small remains of an army, for it is said the number of the slain amounted to eighty thousand. After this action, Kaiser left his army at their winter quarters in the country of the Sequani, and in order to attend to affairs at Rome, went into that part of Gaul which lies on the Po, and was part of his province. For the river Rubicon divides Gaul, which is on this side the Alps, from the rest of Italy. And there he sat down and employed himself in courting people's favor, great numbers coming to him continually, and always finding their requests answered. For he never failed to dismiss all with present pledges of his kindness in hand, and further hopes for the future. And during all this time of the war in Gaul, Pompey never observed how Kaiser was on the one hand using the arms of Rome to effect his conquests, and on the other was gaining over and securing to himself the favor of the Romans with the wealth which those conquests obtained him. But when he heard that the Belgae, who were the most powerful of all the Gauls, and inhabited a third part of the country, were revolted, and had got together a great many thousand men in arms, 
he immediately set out and took his way hither with great expectation. And falling upon the enemy as they were ravaging the Gauls, his allies, he soon defeated and put to flight the largest and least scattered division of them. For though their numbers were great, yet they made but a slender defense, and the marshes and deep rivers were made passable to the Roman foot by the vast quantity of dead bodies. Of those who revolted, all the tribes that lived near the ocean came over without fighting, and he, therefore, led his army against the Nervi, the fiercest and most warlike people of all in those parts. And these live in a country covered with continuous woods, and having lodged their children and property out of the way in the depth of the forest, fell upon Kaiser with a body of sixty thousand men, before he was prepared for them, while he was making his encampment. They soon routed his cavalry, and having surrounded the twelfth and seventh legions, killed all the officers, and had not Kaiser himself snatched up a buckler and forced his way through his own men to come up to the barbarians, or had not the tenth legion, when they saw him in danger, run in from the tops of the hills where they lay and broken through the enemy's ranks to rescue him, in all probability not a Roman would have been saved. But now, under the influence of Kaiser's bold example, they fought a battle, as the phrase is, of more than human courage. And yet with their utmost efforts they were not able to drive the enemy out of the field, but cut them down fighting in their defense. For out of sixty thousand men, it is stated that not above five hundred survived the battle, and of four hundred of their senators, not above three. When the Roman Senate had received news of this, they voted sacrifices and festivals to the gods, to be strictly observed for the space of fifteen days, a longer space than ever was observed for any victory before. The danger to which they had been exposed by the joint outbreak of such a number of nations was felt to have been great, and the people's fondness for Kaiser gave additional luster to successes achieved by him. He now, after settling everything in Gaul, came back again and spent the winter by the Po, in order to carry on the designs he had in hand at Rome. All who were candidates for offices used his assistance, and were supplied with money from him to corrupt the people and buy their votes, in return of which, when they were chosen, they did all things to advance his power. But what was more considerable... The most eminent and powerful men in Rome in great numbers came to visit him at Lucca, Pompey and Crassus, and Appius, the governor of Sardinia, and Nepos, the proconsul of Spain, so that there were in the place at one time one hundred and twenty lictors, and more than two hundred senators. In deliberation here held, it was determined that Pompey and Crassus should be consuls again for the following year, that Kaiser should have a fresh supply of money, and that his command should be renewed to him for five years more. It seemed very extravagant to all thinking men that those very persons who had received so much money from Kaiser should persuade the Senate to grant him more, as if he were in want. Though in truth it was not so much upon persuasion as compulsion that, with sorrow and groans for their own acts, they passed the measure. Cato was not present, for they had sent him seasonably out of the way into Cyprus. But Favonius, who was a zealous imitator of Cato, when he found he could do no good by opposing it, broke out of the hose, and loudly declaimed against these proceedings to the people, but none gave him any hearing, some sliding him out of respect to Crassus and Pompey, and the greater part to gratify a Kaiser, on whom depended their hopes. After this, Kaiser returned again to his forces in Gaul, when he found that country involved in a dangerous war, two strong nations of the Germans having lately passed the Rhine to conquer it, one of them called the Uspies, and other the Tenteritae. Of the war of the people, Kaiser himself has given this account in his commentaries, that the barbarians, 
having sent ambassadors to treat with him, did not suspect their coming, and that afterwards they sent other ambassadors to renew the same fraudulent practices, whom he kept in custody, and led on his army against the barbarians, as judging it mere simplicity to keep faith with those who had so faithlessly broken the terms they had agreed to. But Tanusius states that when the Senate decreed festivals and sacrifices for this victory, Cato declared it to be his opinion that Kaiser ought to be given into the hands of the barbarians, and that so the guilt which this breach of faith might otherwise bring upon the state might be expiated by transferring the curse on him, who was the occasion of it. Of those who passed the Rhine, there were four hundred thousand cut off. Of those few who escaped were sheltered by the Segumbri, the people of Germany. Kaiser took hold of this pretense to invade the Germans, being at the same time ambitious of the honor of being the first man that should pass the Rhine with an army. He carried a bridge across it, though it was very wide, and the current at that particular point very full and strong and violent, and bringing down with its waters trunks of trees and other lumber, which much shook and weakened the foundations of his bridge. But he drove great piles of wood into the bottom of the river above the passage, to catch and stop these as they floated down, and thus fixing his bridle upon the stream, successfully finished his bridge, which no one who saw could believe to be the work of ten days. Kaiser's army was now grown very numerous, so that he was forced to disperse them into various camps for their winter quarters, and he, having gone himself to Italy, as he used to do, in his absence a general outbreak throughout the whole of Gaul commenced, and large armies marched about the country, and attacked the Roman quarters, and attempted to make themselves masters of the forts where they lay. The greatest and strongest party of the rebels, under the command of Abriodrix, cut off Cotta and Titurius with all their men, while the force sixty thousand strong besieged the legion under the command of Cicero, and had almost taken it by storm, the Roman soldiers being all wounded, and having quite spent themselves by defense beyond their natural strength. But Kaiser, who was at a great distance, having received the news, quickly got together seven thousand men and hastened to relieve Cicero. The besiegers were aware of it and went to meet him with great confidence that they should easily overpower such a handful of men. Kaiser, to increase their presumption, seemed to avoid fighting, and still marched off, till he found a place conveniently situated for a few to engage against many, where he encamped. He kept his soldiers from making any attack upon the enemy, and commanded them to raise the ramparts higher and barricade the gates, that by show of fear they might heighten the enemy's contempt of them. Till at last they came without any order and great security to make an assault, when he issued forth and put them in flight with the loss of many men. This quieted the greater part of the commotions in these parts of Gaul, and Kaiser, in the course of the winter, visited every part of the country, and with great vigilance took precautions against all innovations for there were three legions now come to him to supply the place of the men he had lost, of which Pompey furnished him with two out of those under his command. The other was newly raised in the part of Gaul by the Po. But in a while the seeds of war, which had long since been secretly sown and scattered by the most powerful men in those warlike nations, broke forth into the greatest and most dangerous war that was in those parts, both as regards and number of men in the vigor of their youth who were gathered and armed from all quarters, the vast funds of money collected to maintain it, the strength of the towns, and the difficulty of the country were carried on. It being winter, the rivers were frozen, the woods covered with snow, and the level country flooded, so that in some places the ways were lost through the depth of the snow, in others, the overflowing of marshes and streams made every kind of passage uncertain. All which difficulties made it seem impracticable for Kaiser to make any attempt upon the insurgents, 
many tribes had revolted together, the chief of them being the Arverni and Carnutini. The general who had the supreme command in war was Vergentorix, whose father the Gauls had put to death on suspicion of his aiming at absolute government. He, having disposed his army in several bodies, and set officers over them, drew over to him all the country round about as far as those that lie upon the Arar, and having intelligence of the opposition which Kaiser now experienced at Rome, thought to engage all Gaul in the war. Which, if he had done a little later, when Kaiser was taken up with the civil wars, Italy had been put into as great a terror as before it was by the Cimbri. But Kaiser, who above all men was gifted with the faculty of making the right use of everything in war, and most especially of seizing the right moment, as soon as he heard of the revolt, returned immediately the same way he went, and showed the barbarians, by the quickness of his march in such a severe season, that an army was advancing against them which was invincible. For in the time that one would have thought it scarce credible that a courier or express should have come with a message from him, he himself appeared with all his army, ravaging the country, reducing their posts, subduing their towns, receiving into his protection those who declared for him. Till at last the Edui, who hitherto had styled themselves brethren to the Romans, and had been removed much honored by them, and declared against him, and joined the rebels, to the great discouragement of his army. Accordingly he removed thence, and passed the country of the Ligones, desiring to reach the territories of the Sequani, who were his friends, and who lay like a bulwark in front of Italy against the other tribes of Gaul. There the enemy came upon him, and surrounded him with many myriads, whom he also was eager to engage. And at last, after some time and with much slaughter, gained on the whole a complete victory. Though at first he appears to have met with some reverse, and the Arveni show you a small sword hanging up in a temple, which they say was taken from Kaiser. Kaiser saw this afterwards himself, and smiled, and when his friends advised it should be taken down, would not permit it, because he looked upon it as consecrated. After the defeat, a great part of those who had escaped fled with their king into a town called Alessia, which Kaiser besieged, and though the height of the walls and number of those who defended them made it appear impregnable. And meantime, from without the walls, he was assailed by a greater danger than can be expressed. For the choice men of Gaul, picked out of each nation and well armed, came to relieve Alessia to the number of three hundred thousand nor were there in the town less than 170,000. So that Kaiser, being shut up betwixt two such forces, was compelled to protect himself by two walls, one towards the town, the other against the relieving army, as knowing if these forces should join, his affairs would be entirely ruined. The danger that he underwent before Alessia justly gained him great honor on many accounts, and gave him an opportunity of showing greater instances of his valor and conduct than any other contest had done. One wonders much how he should be able to engage and defeat so many thousands of men without the town, and not be perceived by those within, but yet more, that the Romans themselves, who guarded their wall which was next to the town, should be strangers to it. For even they knew nothing of the victory, till they heard the cries of the men and lamentations of the women who were in the town, and had then seen the Romans at a distance carrying into the camp a great quantity of bucklers, adorned with gold and silver, and many breastplates stained with blood, and besides cups and tents made in the Gallic fashion. So soon did so vast an army dissolve and vanish like a ghost or dream the greatest part of them being killed upon the spot. 
and those who were in Alessia, having given themselves in Kaiser much trouble, surrendered at last, and Vergentorix, who was the chief spring of all the war, putting his best armor on and adorning his horse, rode out of the gates, and made a turn about Kaiser as he was sitting, and then, quitting his horse, threw off his armor, and remained quietly sitting at Kaiser's feet until he was led away to be reserved for the triumph. Kaiser had long ago resolved upon the overthrow of Pompey, as had Pompey, for that matter, upon his. For Crassus, the fear of whom had thereto kept them in peace, having now been killed in Parthia, if the one of them wished to make himself the greatest man in Rome, he had only to overthrow the other. And if he again wished to prevent his own fall, he had nothing for it but to be beforehand with him who he feared. Pompey had not been long under any such apprehensions, having till lately despised Kaiser, as thinking it no difficult matter to put down him whom he himself had advanced. But Kaiser had entertained this design from the beginning against his rivals, and had retired, like an expert wrestler, to prepare himself apart for the combat. Making the Gallic Wars his exercise ground, he had at once improved the strength of his soldiery, and had heightened his own glory by his great actions, so that he was looked on as one who might challenge comparison with Pompey. Nor did he let go any of those advantages which were now given him both by Pompey himself and the times, and the ill government of Rome, who all who were candidates for offices publicly gave money, and without any shame bribed the people, who, having received their pay, did not contend for their benefactors with their bare suffrages, but with bows, swords, and slings. So that after having many times stained the place of election with blood of men killed upon the spot, they left the city at last without a government at all, to be carried about like a ship without a pilot to steer her. While all who had any wisdom could only be thankful if a course of such wild and stormy disorder and madness might end no worse than in a monarchy. Some were so bold as to declare openly that the government was incurable but by a monarchy, and that they ought to take that remedy from the hands of the gentlest physician, meaning Pompey, who, though in words he pretended to decline it, yet in reality made his utmost efforts to be declared dictator. Cato, perceiving his design, prevailed with the Senate to make him sole consul, and that with the offer of a more legal sort of monarchy he might be withheld from demanding the dictatorship. They over and above voted him the continuance of his provinces, for he had two, Spain and all Africa, which he governed by the, his lieutenants, and maintained armies under him, at the yearly charge of a thousand talents out of the public treasury. Upon this, Kaiser also sent him petition for the consulship and the continuance of his provinces. Pompey, at first, did not stir in it, but Marcellus and Lentulus opposed it, who had always hated Kaiser, and now did everything, whether fit or unfit, which might disgrace and affront him. For they took away the privilege of Roman citizens from the people of Nucomum, who were a colony that Kaiser had lately planted in Gaul, and Marcellus, who was then consul, ordered one of the senators of that town, then at Rome, to be whipped, and told him he laid that mark upon him to signify he was no citizen of Rome, bidding him, when he went back again, to show it to Kaiser. After Marcellus's consulship, Kaiser began to lavish gifts upon all the public men out of the riches he had taken from the Gauls, discharged Courier the Tribune from his great debts, gave Paulus, then consul, fifteen hundred talents, with which he built the noble court of justice adjoining the forum, to supply the place of that called the Fulpian. Pompey, alarmed at these preparations, now openly took steps, both by himself and his friends, to have a successor appointed in Kaiser's room, and sent to demand back the soldiers whom he had lent him to carry on the wars in Gaul. Kaiser returned them, 
and made each soldier a present of two hundred and fifty drachmas. The officer who brought them home to Pompey spread amongst the people no very fair or favorable report of Geyser, and flattered Pompey himself with false suggestions that he was wished for by Kaiser's army. And those affairs here were in some embarrassment through the envy of some, and the ill state of the government. Yet there the army was at his command, and if they once crossed into Italy would presently declare for him. So wary were they of Kaiser's endless campaigns and expeditions, and so suspicious of his designs for a monarchy. Upon this Pompey grew presumptuous, and neglected all warlike preparations as fearing no danger, and used no other means against him than mere speeches and votes, for which Kaiser cared nothing. And one of his captains, it is said, who was sent by him to Rome, standing before the senators one day, and being told that the senate would not give Kaiser longer time in his government, clapped his hand on the hilt of his sword and said, but this shall. 